Hi everyone, welcome back to the course on quantum theory of many body systems and condensed matter here at the Institute of Physics at the University of Sao Paulo. My name is Luis Gregorio Diaz, and in today's class we're going to cover the topic of phonons. So we're going to start with uh, discussing acoustic phonons in 1D, then the Debye model in 3D, uh, essentially recovering acoustic phonons for, for this 3D lattice. And then we're going to treat the electron phonon interaction and see how it relates to the Coulomb interaction and how we can write it in second quantization. And then uh, we're going then to cover the electron phonon interaction in the Jillian model where it treats the background of positive ions as a constant and see that how phonons can be viewed as a oscillation in density in this background and how it interacts with the electrons always via this attractive Coulomb interaction between electron and phonons and this will set a stage for us to define later uh, Green's functions for phonons in a, in a future class so let's go right into it okay so let's start by considering phonons in 1D so my 1D system will be the one that is sketched here in this in this cartoon where I have positively charged ions in forming a lattice so this is like a description for a material a crystalline material where you have the atoms forming the material sitting at very particular positions in space forming a crystal so this is like a 1d crystal if you wish and this 1d crystal the ions then are in this equilibrium position say if that this lattice is not vibrating they are all sitting here uh, at the same distance from each other this distance is small a sometimes called the lattice constant and of course these ions they interact with each other uh, not only they repel each other because of their positive charge but they are also attracted by each other via the electrons involved in the bonding the chemical bonding between uh, the atoms in the in the crystal right so the these positive charges attract the electrons which are negative but the electrons are you know also attracted to the other positive charges here so it, it creates this kind of a spring effect in fact uh, the intermolecular or interatomic potential between them can be for small deviations from the equilibrium distance can be treated as an, as an harmonic potential something like this right here in the Hamiltonian so it would be uh, if you, I, I treat them these as springs so if the atoms are in their equilibrium positions the springs the spring is relaxed then I'll add elastic quote-unquote energy to the spring by extending it right so let's look for instance at this spring here where it is definitely uh more stretched than the the equilibrium one and the stretching the the difference between the length of the relaxed spring which is a and the length of this uh extended spring is what is the displacement of this ion which was to the right so is u j minus one here uh, i'm labeling this j minus one u j min minus one and let's keep try to label this as a positive uh displacement u j minus one plus this uh, displacement of this other ion now to the right to the left which is a negative displacement u j minus two or if you want would be um minus absolute value of uj minus two so what was the total uh energy stored in this string in the spring would be then one half of its k constant which i'm calling here capital k times the total displacement which would be this uj minus one plus this which would be minus uj minus two where uj minus two is a positive number 
So uj minus 1 minus uj minus 2 would give me then the energy stored in this particular spring. And if I add to all the other springs in the system, I'll get the total energy stored in the in in elastic, right? In in this in these springs or in these harmonic oscillators. So then I have this collection of harmonic oscillators essentially describing my 1D system. Now this is not the, the, the best way to describe the, the Hamiltonian because you know I have this, this difference here so it's not exactly quadratic like in the harmonic oscillator I'd like to, to do to that we saw say in the, the, the beginning of the course. So what what I can do now to make this quote unquote quadratic and especially the displacement here would be something like a quadratic uh, term would be to take a, a Fourier transform something like this where I would define this uq and pq as a Fourier transform of these uj and pj which are written in real space then the the factor here it would be e to the minus iq and this q would be a real number or a, a, an integer right in, in in this case where this r j naught is the equilibrium position for i and j so this essentially the fact that i can do this only reflects the the the, the periodicity of my of my chain here if you want so these displacements can be thought in this q so it's like uh pseudo momentum if you want or in solid state we call it as crystalline momentum if you wish now uh, i'm here considering uh, periodic boundary conditions so this uh last ion here is essentially connected to the to the is, is essentially equivalent to the to the first one so it's connected to the second and so on so it's like this is in a circle, so I can, I can define these. These then in this per periodic boundary conditions, they'll, they'll be become integer numbers. Now, if I substitute that into my Hamiltonian, meaning take the inverse Fourier transform and, and plug in there, then I'll get something which is definitely quadratic in, in the momentum displacement, except that here I have u of q and u of minus q, and the omega uh squared multiplying here in my in my potential and the spring potential would not be a constant would not be just square root of bk which is the spring constant divided by the mass m but will depend on q it would depend on q with a sine of q a over q and you can do this calculation it all comes from this this difference here right when you do uh the the difference here there will be this j minus one meaning that you there will be an e to the minus i q a and then right you can you can write this as a sine of q a over two you can do the calculation but more importantly is that this the omega of q not only depends on q but it it is linear with q for small values of q and that's uh when we have a dispersion like this of an omega of the harmonic oscillator that depends on the q and is linear we call this like an acoustic phonon okay so this frequency goes to zero as q goes to zero now now that i have the my phonon hamiltonian in a more proper uh, way to to treat this as as a quantum harmonic oscillator i can now define those creation and destruction operators that are uh, related to positions and momentum in the harmonic oscillator that we saw early in the course. And these are defined by this, calling B of Q and B dagger of Q, which is B, would be 1 over square root of 2, UQ divided by this LQ, and just like in the harmonic oscillator, this LQ is h bar divided by m omega q. Try to remember to put the the link to that class on the harmonic oscillator. And but there's a catch here. Not only omega depends on, depends on q, but uh, uq 
dagger is not exactly to it equal to itself in this representation, uh, but I have to change q to to minus q, right? When I bec essentially because of this this uh, complex exponential here. So bq dagger is going to be u mi of minus q minus i p minus q, which is good since I have here in the Hamiltonian precisely not pq squared, but pq times p to the minus q, right? And so when I re replace this, or if you want, if I invert these equations and write u of q in terms of bq and b, it's going to be minus q here, right? Because uh, the, of the minus q here, and so on. And I replace that in the in the uh, in the phonon Hamiltonian. What I get is this. Now is truly a collection of quantum harmonic oscillators, sum over q of omega q, b q dagger b q plus one half, and this omega q now is linear with q. So this is my phonon Hamiltonian in 1D and I get indeed acoustic phonons so that the frequency goes linearly with Q. So that was the situation in 1D. What about 3D? What would I get? Then I have now a, a lattice in 3D so you have springs in all three directions not only in one. So of course you increase the number of the the degrees of freedom and that those cues which were integers in in the in the 1d description now become vectors three-dimensional vectors and more in and additionally i'm allowing for a situation where i have not only these acoustic modes but i also have these optical modes and what what are these optical modes uh, these optical modes they, they arise when I have more than one ion or one type of ion per unit cell. So these ions, they might also be linked by, by other springs. And so in addition to these uh, acoustic modes, modes that comes from these sets of ions connected to sets of ions, I also have these other modes coming from, say, these other uh, vibrations within these that uh, occur between these sets of different ions in the same unit cell. And that's why I'm allowing for these other index lambda that will would be then an index of whether I, ha I have acoustic modes or phonon or optical modes in my in my dispersion. For the most part, we're going to focus on the acoustic modes. In fact, we're going to consider a model which only assumes acoustic modes, which is the Debye model. So the Debye model uh, essentially replaced these dispersions of acoustic and optical modes by just one acoustical mode that is spherical in, in Q space with a velocity that's given by the velo this the, the by velocity and uh, this the radius of this sphere in Q space is the Debye uh, vector which is not restricted to the first Brillouin zone so this is a kind of a technical uh, point but it will go uh, beyond the the boundary for the first Brillouin zone in so that's why it will include acoustic mo modes, if you wish. And the value of KD will be set essentially um, by considering uh, the number, the total density of phonons as this. So the number of ions, of course, will be the volume of this sphere in K space. Uh, divided by 2 pi of cube times the, the volume in real space, right? So, or if you want, this would be the density of ions, uh, would be proportional to the vol volume in K space. And then I, I considered KD by considering, okay, the density 
of ions ha has to be uh, this. So the, den the, the volume of this sphere has to be equal to the density times 2, two pi cubed. So that's how we define KD. And then, of course, this will mean that um, the largest frequency would be VD times KD, right? And the maximum energy, or if you want the dispersion, the dispersion in the, the in the Debye, which is linear, the maximum frequency that I would get is the so-called Debye frequency. And h bar times d by frequency, which would be h bar v d times k d, is equal sets an energy scale, which sometimes we call the d by temperature. And now, how good is this approximation? Well, it's quite good. I mean, even for this rather simple model, which I I'm essentially replacing all the structure by one single acoustic phonon, and adjusting my KD so that the density of ions match or, or the density of the material matches here and I get a, a, a phonon density of states that is goes with the square of the energy and if I plug this in and actually calculate say the specific heat and compare with those of metals my 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 the the agreement is pretty good actually so i, I can extract the, these d by temperatures from the data of specific heat so in a sense what, what i mean here the message here is that it's very much okay to at, at least in the case of metals to consider a model where the acoustic phonons even in 3d are the dominant ones and the Debye model is one such approximation that for metals, it works quite okay. Okay, so now that we have established how we can write these uh, phono modes, so these lattice vibration in a quantized form, so essentially uh, sum over uh, harmonic oscillators with these bosonic uh, creation and destruction operators creating and, and destructing these lattice vibrations we can now to start to discuss how these vibrations interact with electrons so in in a sense is is like on top of the electrons involved in a chemical bonding between the ions here for metals i have free electrons or semi free electrons that will be responsible for say the the conduction the conduction of uh, electric current right and they are essentially uh propagating in this lattice of ions now if the i the the lattice is not static or more importantly if if these ions are not rigidly linked to their to their equilibrium position uh, these electrons can off, scatter off, say, one of the ions and change momentum. Uh, and in this process, they will, uh, they will induce a momentum or transfer a momentum into one of these ions. And since these, the, this ion is, is coupled to the other ones, it will, uh, you, you can create a phonon from this scattering uh, this scattering uh, event no so that that would be like uh, an electron coming in scattering off a phonon and uh, uh, an ion and creating a phonon and the electron is deflected to another momentum k prime and so this is one of the process another one is that you you have the light is vibrating so you have say a phonon coming in an electron coming in this way and the 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 vibration essentially scatters off the the electron and deflects it so these are all possible uh events that would essentially be an effective electron phono interaction of course at the heart of everything is a coulomb interaction between the electrons and the ions right so that's somehow disguised in this coupling constant here and 
uh, that's why this coupling constant will depend on the Coulomb interaction in the or its full Fourier transform and we're going to see that how how does that uh, appear and how we can write this electron phonon potential in this way so let's go to the blackboard and try to get this expression for the electron phonon potential which is as i mentioned could describe a process where you destroy an electron with a given momentum k and creates a, an electron with another momentum say k prime or k plus q and in the process you either create or destroy a phonon uh, depending on on the direction of of these phonon but you have to conserve momentum throughout so that's why you have k plus q uh, minus k equals q right so let's see how this works so let's consider then this situation where we have an incoming electron with a momentum k here so it will uh let's let me just write here and then we will interact via coulomb potential with an ion sitting at a position rj not and a is the is the distance between ions the equilibrium distance between ions in this 1d crystal so what happens when this electron interacts with the the ion sitting here so it will usually displace it right so let let's see how how would that work so the electron is coming and interacts with this ion and then displaces it now and the electron of course goes into a, a different momentum afterwards but this displacement is i'm calling you is uj so what i have here is that the new position of the ion rj is the previous position rj not the equilibrium position plus uj and i'm taking uj to be positive here so uh what then would be the potential of that say the coulomb potential that coming from this positive ion in a position x for instance away from the equilibrium position now of course i can expand the coulomb potential in terms of the coulomb potential in, at equilibrium so I, I want essentially the difference between the coulomb potential after the displacement and before so if uh, i have uh, v of x minus rj would be equals to v of x minus rj naught plus the the difference between this and this and the difference between this and this would be minus uj times the derivative of the potential with respect to x which is a coordinate here uh, at uj equals zero so just so uh we understand that this sign is a minus sign you can just uh, say that minus rj equals minus rj naught minus uj and if you add x to both sides you get precisely this minus sign there all right so that's uh the the difference between this the coulomb potential this extra say gradient of the coulomb potential that i would feel at a, at a given position now what's the electron phonon interaction here well, of course it would be a coulomb potential coulomb, coulomb interaction between with so would be a minus e which is the density of of the electrons here say right and, and a given position x uh, times the combined actions of the potential coming from all the ions at a given position x so let's say that x is 
this particular position here, right? So this is X. So this electron, what would it feel? And notice that these are all these other uh, ions can be vibrating as well. Well, uh, it will be uh, then the Coulomb potential from all the ions at this particular position x times the density, the electron density here. Uh, integrated, of course, in 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 x, so that would give me a an energy. So it'll give me a constant term first, coming from you know the the potential the equilibrium positions. But what I'm really interested is in the change of these electron phonon energy when this particular ion is displaced or all the ions are somehow displaced by uj so what i would get is something like this uh, this would be then expanded in in this form i get this minus sign here transform this minus e coming from the electron charge to plus and then i would have the uj's times the gradient of v plus a constant term here there would be a constant term there but i'm essentially and, and this is the one in equilibrium so i'm not worried about that. i want to know what what's the difference between this and the and the one at, at the equilibrium so the larger this gradient the larger would be the, the difference and here we can see that uh, this gradient will play an important role in the interaction between the vibration of these ions and the electrons. So let's continue the calculation now. Now remember that I can write this UJ as a Fourier transform and I can also write them in terms of uh, those phonon creation and, and destruction operators. Uh, and another step I want to do is to calculate this gradient here. And for that, we're going to do a Fourier transform in the in the potential, the ion, the ion, ionic potential at a position x, uh, center at these R J. So because of the nature of these R J, so that this potential is periodic in space, I can define this Fourier transform here, 1 over L, sum over Q, and this there should be a Q here. Sorry. Q. VQ e to the IQ x minus RJ. So essentially the Fourier transform of the, the, the potential. Now let me add the, the displacement. So the displacement uh, uj can also write in a Fourier series, and this would be the uk e to the ik rj naught, and the uk I can write in terms of the phonon creation and destruction operators. That's a, as I saw in a previous slide. And in addition, I can take now the derivative of this with respect to x and uh, evaluate that at the equilibrium positions. So that would be V, uh, there is no, uh, yeah, I dropped this ion here, this is just V, uh, one over L, and then when I take the derivative with respect to X, there's this IQ that comes down. And now I'm evaluating this as UJ equals zero or RJ equals RJ naught. And now I'm going to plug these two into here. So I'm going to plug this here, this here, and this one there, and see what happens. And when I do that, uh, I'll, I'll get something like that. The charge, I'll, I'll do the integral later, but let's see. I'll, I'll plug this charge times this sum, and this, of course, will be there will be a sum over k 1 over 2 square root of 2n there will be lk the phonon operators then there's 
going to be this 1 over L here, sum over Q, which I forgot to put. Let's put it here too. Forgot another sum over Q. PQ to the IQX coming from the gradient. And then there will be uh, these terms in RJ0, which will be K minus Q. Okay? And once, and of course, there would be the sum in J. Oh, this is J. Sorry. This is J. And the sum over J combined with this exponential here will give me n times delta k q. So if k equals q, this sum will give me, this would be 0, this would be n. If k is different than q, this will give me 0 since I'm summing over all rj here. Now, uh, then there would be this delta k q, which will give me 1 over l, uh, sum over q, so everything that was q becomes q, everything that was k becomes q, so minus q be q, and there is a dagger here. Uh, yeah, there's a dagger here, and there is a hat here, and there's be a iqx, and so so on so forth. So this already has uh, the structure that uh, we're looking for. And I'm calling this my coupling constant. E times LQ, notice that LQ uh, depends on the frequency, right? And it depends on, on the momentum, and it depends on the Coulomb potential, the Fourier transform of, of the Coulomb potential here. So this here is going to be my electron phonon coupling constant. So electron phonon. On coupling. And there is this, uh, the, the phonon uh, operators are here, and there's this exponential there. So, but where are the electron creation and destruction operators? Well, they, they will come from the density. So, let's see how does that work. So, I scroll down a little bit. So, the electron density at a position x. It is essentially the number operator at, at a position x, right? So these are field operators. Yeah, I should, should have written something like this. Not, uh, not the way that it's written here. It would be something like... The field operator at a position x, field operator position x, that's the density. And then if I take the Fourier transform of that in the, in the lattice, uh, there will be one of the square root of L for each, there will be a CK dagger uh, e to the minus ikx, CK e to the plus ikx, and uh, yeah, I t I'll, if I take one of the sums here, and I'm just changing the, the variables here. K prime equals K plus a P, P prime. So, yeah, just changing the variables. That's what I get for the for the density, right? So this is P prime, and I, that's what I get for the density. Now, uh, my electron phono interaction then will become, uh, there's this integral of rho x in x times this term, right? And so that's where my two uh, creation and destruction operators come, come, come in. Now there's one extra point that I'll have this exponential in e to the minus i p prime x, and there's this exponential in i q x, and I'll have this integral in x, and that will give me yet another delta function, which will be the delta function of q and p prime. So with that, I end up having my uh, electron phonon interaction in the final form. The, this L cancels with one of these, and I have some of Q, K, the coupling constant, GQ, 
C dagger K plus Q, C, K, and then the bosonic operators, and there's, of course, a dagger missing here. A dagger missing, and a hat missing. Uh, a dagger missing there as well. And a hat missing here. Yeah, okay. And that's the electron phonon coupling in 1D. Now, to go through 3D, what do I do? I just replace the length of the chain with a volume, and these vectors, these Q's and K's, with the vectors, right, for all throughout, and I get the result that we had before in the slide. So let's go back to the slide now. So we're back to the slide, and notice, so we derived uh, the electron phonon uh, coupling uh, expression, and also uh, derived expression for the electron phonon coupling, right, in terms of V and Q, and there's omega Q here too. And now you can see these, uh, in second quantization, it becomes more clear that uh, idea of scattering that I, I mentioned in, in, a, in a previous slide, that you have, say, two processes here, one that involves the creation of a phonon and the, the other that involves uh, destruction of a phonon. So let's start with this one that involves the creation. So I have, which is essentially reflected here. So I have an incoming electron with momentum k, and it scatters off an ion, and creates this vibrational mode, right? So when it scatters off an ion, it uh, gains a momentum, right? So it goes right here. So in order to conserve momentum. I have to have a uh, phonon with momentum minus Q come in here, so that uh, I have K coming, K plus Q leaving, and a phonon with momentum minus Q leaving the vertex. And that that's, is going to be an important point that whenever I have a momentum minus Q leaving the a momentum leaving the vertex, a phonon momentum leaving the vertex is propagated with momentum minus Q, right? If this would gain momentum Q. So that that's creating a phonon. Now I can have the, the other way around, right? So I have say a phonon coming into the vertex and a momentum also coming in. And then the electron scatters off this phonon and it sort of absorbs it, right? And so the full momentum of the, the, the phonon coming into the vertex is absorbed by the, by the electron and it, it scatters off with momentum K plus Q. So notice here that this Q might be even negative so that this would then get momentum, but the, from this expression, what I'm the let's see the standard or the convention is that if a phonon is going into the vertex, it goes with momentum Q, and if it's leaving the vertex, it is leaving with momentum minus Q, right? So that's the, the two basic diagrams in the electron phonon interaction. And just another comment that in the next class we're going to calculate this propagator for phonons as we have calculated the propagators for electrons, the free electron pro propagators in, in previous classes. All right, so to, to close down this class, let's uh, talk a little bit about the electron phonon interaction in the Jillian model, uh, which is as we saw in the class on on the electron gas, and I'll try to put the link here, that is a model that instead of treating these ions in a lattice like we did so far, it actually treats them as a density, as a uniform positively charged density of ions, so that the whole system is neutral, such that uh, uh, 
each of these ions have Z, say, positive charges, where Z is the atomic number. So Z times the density of ions e equals to the density of electrons, right? So the whole system is neutral. So that's the Jillian model. And we're going to see that here the phonons are actually vibrations or, or oscillations in this density this background density that 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 would what would phonons be and here there is one uh frequency that is called the plasma frequency for for this density of charge charge uh positive charge ions and that's what the frequency of the phonons will be so in the Jillian model that's uh what we call phonons is essential fluctuations over the equilibrium density of the ions. So, in fact, the plasma frequency can be evaluated. It depends only on the, the atomic number for, you know, the number of charges on, the, on each point and the, the density of ions, which can be related to the density of electrons and divided by the mass of the ion and the, the electric constant. So that's the plasma frequency. And let's go to the blackboard and see how we can derive this result real quick. So let's consider then the case of the jelly model where you have a uniform ion density, which I'm calling rho, rho ion. And the system is whole neutron. So I can relate rho ion to the density uh, uh, essentially this way. So the number of ions, which is the volume of the system times rho ion, times the number of charges in each of in each ion, which is z, uh, the the atomic number, has to be equal to the number of electrons. So that's the neutrality of the system is uh, enforced by that. So that that takes us to that previous equation that I showed in the slide that rho ion times z equals the, the electron density. So let's keep that in mind, right? But this is the equilibrium situation. So the density of ions is constant and is equal to this, right? Independently of the position and independently of time. Now, what is a phono? A phono is a perturbation in this. Something like uh, a wave if you want where the density of positive charge uh, ions is larger in some regions of the system and smaller in others something like this something like this where i would have then oscillations in the charge and i would have a deviation from the uniform case which I'm considering to be delta rho, okay? And that can change in both position and in time. And the time uh, change is the one that we are, we are most interested on, and we're going to see that the, there's, this will oscillate as an harmonic oscillator with a grieving frequency omega, which is going to be the plasma frequency. So it can, I, I might have this, uh, non-uniformity in space but the behavior in time is going to be like an harmonic oscillator and we're going to argue why why that is so the way we're going to approach the problem here is through classical electrodynamics so let's consider say that the density is a sum of this uniform density rho ion plus this fluctuating part delta rho which then can change in both position and time. So uh, we write then the continuity equation for the total uh, charge density, which is the, the changes in time of the density is equal to the divergence of the current. And the current is just the density times the, the velocity of, the, of a given charge here. And this charge will be, say, an ion, a positive charge ion, with charge ZE and SM. That's uh, the dynamics of the charge that we're, or these individual charges that we're considering. All right. But 
this of course we're treating in, in the continuum so, so we have the continuity equation uh, for for the system and this is all classical right there's no quantized fields here uh, with that of course if I have this gradient in or this uh, this charge density will have an electric field associated with it uh, and that leads us to a Poisson equation on, for the electric field. So the divergence of the electric field is the charge times the density right here divided by epsilon zero. So we're going to combine these two equations in order to get the plasma frequency. Notice that the only uh, contribution for this time derivative comes from this term, right? And uh, so let's see how we can combine these two equations to get a harmonic oscillator type of equation for delta rho. So an addition point that we should consider is, as, as I mentioned, is the, let's call it the classical charge dynamics. Right, so I'm going to put the classical here. Uh, classical. So that, well, the, each ion has a mass m, charge z e. So uh, given the electric field that would be created by its own uh, density, charge density, it will acquire a velocity. So there will be a, a current, if you want, positive charge current. So then for each of these charges, we can apply, say, Newton's second law considering the classical dynamics. And I think that's the first time I, I mentioned Newton's second law in this course, which is interesting. Uh, so then the mass times the acceleration equals the force, which would be, of course, the charge times the field, all right? But then uh, the, the trick here is to take the divergent on both sides. So I take the divergent, the divergent here and the divergent there. So I have m times the time derivative of the, the divergence of the velocity equals uh, z times e times the divergence of the field with from Poisson's equations, we know that should be the charge times the density divided by epsilon naught, epsilon zero, okay? So this is, this comes essentially from our from Newton's laws. So now I'm rewriting the continuity equation here. Uh, so, and I'm gonna now expand this. Remember, and here I have that this is the sum over of that uniform part plus this oscillating part. Now, if, of course, the time derivative here would be only the time derivative of this, but here I'll, I'll argue that this actually should be uh, something else. And to first order in delta rho, notice that uh, the divergent of the velocity already has a contribution would which would be uh, of order delta rho here. So uh, this would be what? It would be the divergence of this times the velocity time time plus this times the divergence of the velocity. And the only term which is linear in delta rho would be this constant times the divergence of velocity. The other one which would have say something like uh, this rho times divergence of rho times v would be second order, right? Since I already have uh, delta rho here of order rho. So uh, given that, of course, I can, I can write the continued equation as this time derivative of delta rho 
plus rho i n times the divergence of v. And if I now take a second derivative on both sides here, so I, uh, I take an yet another derivative, here I'll have a second derivative of this, it's the only thing in here that depends on time. If I pass this to the right hand side, I'll get a minus, I'll have this rho i n, and then I'll have the time derivative of, of the gradient of v, so I'll get z e squared divided by m epsilon zero, right? So there is uh, th this m goes here, times um, delta rho, and that's the, the the one in first order that I'll, I'll get from 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 this expression. So in first order in delta rho, I get a harmonic oscillator type of equation with a frequency omega square which is right this what's written right here right so this is omega square and now this omega square is given by this expression which is omega square equals z e squared the charge on each ion times the density of ions divided by the mass of the ion divided by epsilon zero so i can uh, put this in terms of the density of electrons by remembering that uh, oh, there's a an e missing here that uh, the number of ions times say the volume times the number of positive charges on each ion has to be equal to the number of electrons right so that's charge neutrality right there so z rho ion has to be equal to the density let me put it, this is the is the density so then I'll have the, the, the density of electrons all right so given that so that this has to be equal to the density of electrons so this then gives me the plasma frequency the classical classical plasma frequency for the Gillian model so which is a function of only the, the, the properties of the material the atomic number and the mass of the of the ion and uh, the density of electrons right so the larger the density the larger is the the plasma frequency so that's a typical frequency which I, I would expect oscillations from that background, that positive charge background, which is the equivalent our, as our phonon frequency here. All right, so let's go back to the slide. So now I calculated my classical plasma frequency for the Gillian model. And the idea here is now is to consider that my phonons, which is the quantum version of those oscillations, will oscillate precisely with this same frequency and then my electron phono interaction will have precisely that the same uh, uh, structure that I derived for the case of phonons in the lattice except that my now my coupling instead of having that uh, acoustic frequency here will have just a uh, uniform frequency for, for the Gillian model. Uh, the other point is that, of course, I could, instead of using the Gillian model, just do the Debye model, and then the frequency here would be the Debye frequency, and, and, and so on. That We're going to, to discuss that uh, a little bit later. But the important point is, is this. Uh, depending on, on the, your model, your 
coupling constant might have uh, different uh, expressions, but usually it will always depend on the Coulomb potential, the Fourier transform, uh, it times the momentum, right? And will depend here also on the frequency of the of the phonons. Now, one important point that it's going to be useful. Notice that this in the Jillian model will depend on the square root of the volume, right? Why? It beca because of the density, right? So when when I I have the density there, uh, it will um, enter here as the number of electrons here. So instead of the density, it's going to be uh, n uh, v r. So if I take the absolute value square of the coupling and divide it by the volume, it's going to give me one half v q times h bar omega, which is the the typical phonon frequency, and that's how we can uh, that's a typical phonon energy, sorry, and that's how we can relate these different energy scales with the phonon energy scales with the electron phonon coupling. So that's it for this class, and in the next class we're going to talk about uh, the free phonon propagator and phonon Green's functions, and see how we can get an effective electron-electron interactions mediated by phonons, which can be even attractive. So see you in next class.